Well, good morning, Moody Church. Good morning, Moody Church. Um, my name is Philip Miller, and it is a real honor. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you, open God's word uh, with you this morning. Um, there's a very great danger that we might fall into in this moment unless we're careful. Um, I'm reminded of a time back in my seminary days when we had preaching classes, and um, I would come in to preach, and the professor would be behind a sheet of glass reading notes into a microphone, and all my peers and colleagues would be taking notes on an evaluation form. And um, my chief concern in preaching was to do a good job and get a good grade, and everyone's chief concern in listening was to evaluate and decide if they liked it. And uh, the danger in that, of course, is that we never actually see Jesus. <laughs> And that is, would be a huge tragedy. And so I'm going to pray for us in just a moment because what we need this morning is to see Jesus. Amen? So let's pray that God would give us that great mercy. He would calm my heart. He would help you listen to hear the voice of Jesus this morning as we look to him. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray together. Father, we ask you now for your mercy, your grace, that you would show us your son by the power of your spirit, would you open our eyes so that we might walk in obedience and strength, that we would surrender our lives more fully and follow Jesus this day and all the days of our life. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You know, this COVID-19 thing, I know everyone's talking about it. Everyone keeps saying what an unprecedented time we're in, and it's true. Um, I think it's really remarkable. Um, we've, everywhere I go, I see people who are afraid, uh, who are feeling shaken, uh, who feel like their lives have been upended. Maybe you're one of them. I certainly feel that way. Uh, we have to stay at home, and I flew here on a plane with 12 people on it, a 737 with nobody there. The flight crew was a third of the passenger load. I mean, this, these are crazy times. And I think humbling times in many ways. Um, you know, we tend to think of these things happening in other countries, other continents. This stuff doesn't happen to us, not with our education, not with our medical expertise, not with, uh, you know, all the things going for us, our affluence and all of that. But in this moment, it seems like everything that we've put our security in has just been crumbling. Our financial markets, our job markets, um, our society as we know it, even the ability to just go eat out, uh, normalcy has been disrupted, and everything is starting to feel, I think, a lot, a little bit of like chaos and darkness and disorder and unraveling, and it's uncomfortable. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I've been praying in my time with the Lord is, God, what are you doing right now? What, what on earth are you up to? Because here's what we know about our God. Our God is a God who brings... Um, light out of darkness. Our God is a, a God who brings order out of chaos. Our God is a God who brings beauty from ashes. Our God is a God who brings resurrections from crucifixions. This is what our God does. And so in the midst, wherever there are chaos waters, the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the deep and he is calling forth life. And so the question I've been asking is, what is this life, God, that you are drawing forth and calling into being in this time, in this moment? What are you doing? And as I was meditating on that and thinking about it, I really believe the Lord brought us to the passage we're going to look at today that I want to share with you. This is Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 13 to 19. If you do have a copy of God's Word with you, please open it up, and you can join us there. You'll also see the words on the bottom of the screen here, so you can follow along easily in that way. This is Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. And he, this is Jesus, he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name, gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, I love that. And Andrew and Philip, not me, a different one, uh, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Thanks 
be to the Lord for the reading of his word. Those of you who know your Bibles will know this is a a classic summary passage of when Jesus drew and called his disciples to himself. He picks 12 disciples. The the Greek word for disciple is mathetes. And wherever you are, just would you say that with me together? Mathetes, let's do it together. Mathetes, good job. And um, mathetes means learner. It means disciple, follower, or my my favorite definition uh, I got from Dallas Willard. It is apprentice, apprentice. Uh, And we know what apprenticeship is all about, right? You have a master who has expertise, you have an apprentice who's trying to learn, and the goal of apprenticeship is to know what your master knows, to see what your master sees, to react the way your master reacts, to do what your master does, and to master what your master has mastered, right? And so the question is, what has Jesus mastered, right? What is Jesus the master of? And the reality is he's the master of life. He's master of life with God. He, he knows God better than anyone else. He's the master of life with one another. He lives a life of agape love. He's the master of life in this world. He knows how to live with power and strength in this world, this broken down world. And so Jesus here is inviting his disciples to come to apprentice their lives to him in order that they might also learn how to live, to have life, abundant life through Jesus. And in this passage today, there are three invitations from Jesus that I want you to see. And uh, we're going to walk through them each in turn, but let me give them to you up front. The first one is, come be with me. The second one is come together and become like me. And the third one is come join me in the work that I am doing. So let's go through those each in turn. First, come be with me. Uh, Jesus goes up on the mountain. He calls these 12 disciples to himself, handpicks them. These are the ones he wants. And he, in verse 14, says, this is why, so that they might be with him. They might be with him. He is inviting them to relationship, to connection, to friendship, to time spent together, togetherness. In John chapter 15, Jesus invites you and I into a similar kind of relationship when he says, come abide in me, abide in me. This is the language of nesting or residence or settling down. It's like come settle down and make your life in who I am. Am. It's a beautiful invitation. It's amazing to me that the God who spun galaxies into space and who designed neuroplasticity would come and bring his, would invite us to come and climb up on his lap um, to, like a little kid climbs into their daddy's arms. What a beautiful picture. Come be with me. Now, here's what, I, here's what I know. We often become like the people we hang around. Have you ever noticed that? How quickly we become like the people we're around? That's why we care about our kids and who they hang out with, who their friends are. Um, and this happens on mostly a subconscious level. I, I remember one time my, my, uh, my dad's friend, Ron, uh, was at our home church in Ohio looking over the balcony and he saw what he thought was my father walking across the, the lower level. And he thought, oh, that's Dwayne. But then he looked a little closer and he said, that's, that can't be Dwayne. Um, and he thought it was me back from college, right? But it wasn't me. It was my grandpa. My grandpa was visiting from Kansas City. And, um, but here's what's crazy. Mr. Ron knew the way my dad walked. It was the way that I walked. It was the way my grandpa walked. Now, here's what's crazy. I never have consciously thought, oh, I'm going to walk like my dad. My dad never thought that about his grandpa, and my grandpa surely walks like his father did, and and that's nothing he ever consciously did. My point is, it was caught, not taught, right? It was caught, not taught. And the point here that I'm trying to, to make is neurobiologists have told us that we have these things called mirror neurons in our brains. God designed us this way to imitate, to look at, to admire people and consciously or subconsciously actually imitate the actions of those people. It's the primary way we learn. And so 
What this means is that our heroes, our role models, the people we hang out with matter tremendously for the people we will become. And so if we have people in our lives that we give our attention, our admiration to, who are, say, stressed or irritable, we will find ourselves with rising levels of frustration and anger, right? If we give our attention to people who are worried and fretful and we look to them, we will find ourselves with rising anxiousness and nervousness. If if we look to people who are and heroize, you know, look up to people who are tough and aggressive, we will find ourselves becoming hard and impatient. But the same thing is true. Let's listen. The same thing is true if I give my attention to someone who is brimming with love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. That if I give my attention to my heavenly Father, to the beauty of the Son of God, Jesus himself, and the power of the life of the Holy Spirit, if I look to the triune God, to one to be many and to many to be one, and see in them the character of, of the divine life, I will find myself starting to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. As Jesus says in John 15, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. But of course, the only way to do that is to spend time, right? You can't rush relationships just like you can't rush a relationship with God. It doesn't work in your family. It won't work with God either. And this takes time. And here's what I've found. God is not hurried. God is not rushed. We walk with God. We don't run with God. We don't sprint with God. We don't jog with God. We walk with God. His heartbeat is calm and steady. His pace is slow. And we have to learn to slow down to be with him. Could it be that in these moments right now, where our pulses are racing, where the world is filled with anxiety and no one knows what the future holds, that in this moment, Jesus is inviting us close, that he's saying, come, be with me, abide in me, rest in me, find peace and strength in my presence. Could this be? I remember when our kids were little, like babies, one of the things the doctors taught us to do was when our kids were crying and freaked out and just panicking, they don't know how to self-regulate. And so you have to teach them this as parents. And one of the things they taught us to do was to take our children and hold them to our, our chests. Because there's something about a parent's heart as it beats in slow, rhythmic ways that calms the child down. And the child looks up and sees its parent and remembers that it's safe and knows, it remembers who it is that it is a beloved child, loved and in the arms of a safe parent who loves them more than life itself. And so here's, here's the truth that I've learned. When we rest in Jesus, we remember who we are, don't we? It's about identity. Could it be that in all this chaos right now, that Jesus is in fact calling you, calling me, back into our identity as children of God. Could it be? That's Jesus' first invitation. Come be with me. The second invitation here is come together and become like me. Come together and become like me. When Jesus invited these disciples to himself, he also invited them into community one with another. It's such a wild group of people here in verses 16 to 19. You've got loud mouths, Peter, hot heads, James, James and John. You've got tax collectors, Matthew. You've got anarchists, Simon. You have believers and doubters and betrayers. You have friends and foes alike, and they're all here thrown in together. And Jesus is cutting across social economic lines, he's political preferences, educational levels, religious standing. He's just creating the most diverse group of people and it's kind of like a powder keg ready to explode, right? And you say, Jesus, what are you thinking? What are you thinking here? I mean, wh- why don't you use a psychology profiling assessment and get people who can get along together? Why would you create this group? It's never gonna work. 
But Jesus has intention here. He calls this diverse group of people together because he knows that transformation requires abrasion. Transformation requires abrasion, like when two things rub together. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. See, that the reality is Jesus' aim is to transform us into his image so that we might resemble him in glory. And the only way that's going to happen is if he rubs off all the rough edges of our lives. He has to refine us. And one of the tools he uses is other people who rub up against us. Not only do we receive benefit and nurture and care and compassion and kindness from our fellow believers in Christ, fellow disciples, we also receive abrasion and we rub up against people. And Jesus uses all of that to make us more like himself. Here's the point. We cannot become like Jesus by ourselves. We cannot become like Jesus by ourselves. If you think about it, how much of the fruit of the Spirit can be expressed by yourself in your room, all by yourself, in social distancing? How, how much of your, the fruit of the Spirit can actually be expressed here? Think about it. Love? No. Joy? Maybe. Peace? Maybe. Patience? Oh, Patience assumes someone's obnoxious in your life, doesn't it? It assumes someone there is driving you bonkers. You can't do that without someone there. Kindness, that's a relational term. Goodness, that's about doing the right thing under pressure. The pressure has to come from somewhere. Faithfulness, that's to relationships and promises and covenants. Uh, Gentleness, relational, self-control, not just self-mastery, but self-regulation in relationships with other people. My point is, look at how much of this requires one another one another. The point is simply this. It is not good for man to be alone. We were made for community. We were made for one another. We need each other's compassion, and we also need the challenge that we bring into one another's lives. As Hebrews 10 verses 24 to 25 says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day, the day of Jesus' return drawing near. So here's the question. How on earth do you do that right now? How do you do that in social distancing? Well, let me give you a little idea here. Social distancing is not the same thing as relational distancing. It's not the same thing as emotional distancing. And it is not the same thing as spiritual distancing. It's not. This moment where we are isolated physically, and we need to do that, we dare not isolate emotionally, relationally, and spiritually from one another. We need each other now more than we probably have ever needed one another. It's so easy right now to fall into isolation and loneliness, and I'm telling you, when you're alone, bad stuff happens. We get, we get in trouble. It's like a coal that in the fire stays warm and glowing. You take it out separately and everything begins to fade. We can't let that happen to us. So here's my encouragement. Would you dare to try some new things? Like pray with each other over the phone? Like read scripture with each other over a Zoom call? Like have a soul level conversation over Skype? I know it's weird, but it's what Jesus is gonna call us to here. Would you share encouragement with each other over FaceTime? Maybe even lip sync a worship song on TikTok. I don't know, whatever you need to do, okay? This is an opportunity. We dare not stop being the family of God. We all have gifts that other people need to share with us. Our own spiritual gifts, we've got to give it. And we also need uh, the care of our fellow disciples right now. And here's what I know. When we are interdependent with one another, we grow in family resemblance. We are God's family, and we learn to act like ourselves, like the family of God. And so could it be 
that in the midst of all this chaos, Jesus is calling us back into our family. Could it be that in all this chaos, Jesus is calling us back into our family, the family of God? It's Jesus' second invitation here. Come together and become like me. The third invitation here is come join me in the work that I am doing. Come join me in the work that I am doing. The text says that Jesus appointed these 12 disciples. He called them in verse 14. He named them apostles. Apostolos means sent ones. It means that that not only is he gathering them into himself, he will send them out on the mission that Jesus is all about. And this is what Jesus does with each and every one of us. Not only does he call us to himself and draw us to himself and cover us in the work of Jesus when he died in our place and for our sake and bore all of our sin and shame on the cross and rose again to give us life in God forever. If we would just admit that we are sinners, believe on Jesus Christ and commit our lives to following him. Not only does this bring us in and make us children of God so that we belong to God, He doesn't stop there. He sends us out on mission. Jesus gathered them in to send them out. He says in verse 14, he appointed 12 so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. And so he sends them out on this twofold mission here, a mission of proclamation and liberation. Proclamation and liberation and liberation. He sends them to proclaim the good news that in Jesus Christ, God has reconciled all things, including us, to himself through the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension and enthronement of Jesus. It's also a liberating work. He sends them out to bring freedom because wherever the good news of Jesus goes, when it arrives in our souls, it brings freedom from all the oppression of sin, death, and Satan himself. And this is the same great commission that Jesus gave right before he went back to his father. He gave to you, to me, to everyone who calls on the name of Jesus as a follower of him. When Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and I will be with you to the very end of the age. In this time, friends, of social distancing where we're separate and we're cloistered in our rooms and all of this, we dare not distance ourselves from the great commission that Jesus gave us. There is still grace to share. There is still compassion to unleash. There is still kindness to offer. There is still hope to extend. There is still love to give. There is still freedom to proclaim. And there is still good news of great joy that shall be for all peoples. And so Jesus has given you and me this grand purpose for our lives, to join him in the work he is doing in the world, to draw all peoples to himself so that they might be reconciled to his father and might worship him forever. And he has sent every single one of us into the places where we live, work, learn, and play, to people who are far from Jesus but near to us, And we have the message of good news. We have good news to proclaim. We have liberation to share in Jesus Christ. And here's what I know. When you and I, when we embrace the mission of God, not only do we find our great purpose in life, we find rich meaning for all of our days and for forever. Could it be that in the midst of all this chaos, Jesus is calling us back into our purpose, into the very reason we are here. Could it be? It's his third invitation. Come join me in the work I am doing. As I was flying here on that plane with 12 people on it, I was was praying. 
I was praying for you. I was praying for Moody Church. I was praying for my congregation back home. I was praying for myself and all these things. One of the things I asked the Lord is I said, Lord, would you please give me your heart for this people, for this church, for this city, for this nation, this world. Would you share your heart with, um, with me? And I really believe as I was on that plane that God really met me in a pretty special way. It was actually, I've had four major moments where I really have felt the presence and glory of God. It, Wednesday was one of those. And um, I felt like he really shared an impression of his heart. And I was asking, God, what are you doing in all of this chaos? What do you want to do? As everything is crumbling, what are you up to? What is the spirit hovering, hovering over these waters? What is the life he's calling forth? And he, here's what I sensed from the heart of God. I, I sensed that God wants to use this moment to bring renewal and revival and hope to the world to draw people to himself. It's, it's what he does best. It's what he's done in the past. He's done it before. Remember when the plagues hit the Roman Empire? It was those moments where the Christians rose up in strength. When Rome fell as an empire, it was the church that became the stability for the people. When the civil war was brewing, it was the beginning of awakening in this country. It's when this church began in its roots with, with D.L. Moody. It, it, when, when the world wars had ravaged uh, the planet, it was in that era that God cultivated a spiritual awakening and drew many back to himself. In fact, in every major movement of God's spirit in history, it has always been preceded by chaos and pain and social unrest and upheaval. And as I prayed, I really felt like the Lord was, this is his heart. He wants to bring life, revival. He wants to call many back to himself. You know, C.S. Lewis said um, something like, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts to us in our pains. It is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf, a deaf world. I think this is what God may be up to. But as I was praying, he also impressed me with one other thing. He said, it's gonna begin in his church. It's gonna begin with his people. This life that he wants to begin, it starts with you, with me, with us. He will do it through us, but he will first do it in us. Could it be that in all this chaos, Jesus is actually calling you and me back to himself, to a closeness and intimacy with him, to be really truly the family of God as he longs for us to be, and to embrace the mission of God in a way that is dynamic, that takes over and we surrender to what he wants to do? Could it be that in all of this chaos, the spirit of God is hovering over the waters and calling forth life, that from all this groaning, God wants to birth something new? Here's the takeaway for today. It's just a simple question. What is Jesus inviting you to? What is Jesus' invitation to you? It's a personal question. I, I think God's going to impress this on your heart by his spirit in a way that is very unique and customized to your life. I think we're probably all going to walk out of this moment with totally different action points, but all from the same spirit of God. What is Jesus' invitation to you this morning? Can I ask you wherever you are, whether you're online or sitting on your couch or maybe you're still in bed drinking coffee, whatever you're doing, could you just pause for a moment? Would you bow your head and pray with me and ask God to just put something on your heart, a way for you to respond, to surrender, to say yes to the invitation that Jesus is making to you, to follow God in, with all of your life, I think he wants us, all of us, to be fully his, 
to yield to what he wants to do, to say yes to him. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these invitations from the heart of Jesus. Father, help us to draw near, to come close. Forgive us for the busyness, the hurry, the distractions. Maybe it's time that we just turn off Netflix for a moment, turn off Disney Plus, put the phone down, open up your scriptures, pray and seek your face, to slow down, to feel your heart beat, that we might know and remember that we are your beloved children. And there's nothing we add or subtract to the finished work of Jesus that we rest in your love by grace. We pray that you would remind us who we are, that we would come home into your arms. Father, I pray maybe right now some of us are thinking, I, I've been isolated and I, I have not been giving myself to the family of God. I've been, I've been sheltered. I've been pulling away. Father, help us to reach out, to make the phone call, to share our souls, even in an uncomfortable way. We pray for your transforming power. Help us to be open and real, to bring everything into the light. Father, some of us, we've, we've got, we all of us really, we have sin deep down and we need to bring it into the light. It's scary to share that with other people. But Father, we pray that you would purify us. Give us clean hands and pure hearts. Let us not bow down our souls to another. Purify our lives, we pray. And Father, maybe some of us are just thinking about people far from Jesus, but near to us. Maybe they live down the hall, or maybe they're a coworker at work, or Father, would you give us the, the courage, the guts to just reach out, to check in, to see how people are doing, to come up with creative ways to unleash compassion? Father, would you use us in your great work to reconcile all people to yourself? Father, we yield, we surrender, we give you our everything. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.